Today is a sad day um, because we come to the conclusion of the book of Galatians. Uh, 22 weeks. Um, I loved it. I, I hope you have too. Uh, I'm sad to see it end. Uh, but I'm also stressed because the last sermon is just a very demanding uh, sermon. We're going to make sure and summarize the text. And if you want to hit the text right, we're going to make sure and summarize the whole book. We're going to make sure you guys appreciate Paul's main message. There's a lot to do um, this morning. Um, so we've got to get in. Um, and again, apologies um, for the, the temperature. Uh, the heat is gone. Uh, we have men waiting in sickness of water below us um, as we speak. Uh, men's got to go change. Um, but uh, we've been scraping sidewalks and... and Shoveling water out, and uh, we'll, we'll get it fixed. Um, but yeah, so forgive us for, for the OD. old building, old boiler, but we'll survive. We'll warm you guys up. Um, I'm going to get hot up here. I hope you guys do um, down there. Um, so let's get into Galatians. Um, what Paul does here, it's fantastic uh, because he just he wants to summarize his letter, so it, he makes my job a little bit easier here. And and he does so. He really brings his A game in these last couple of verses, right? He he brings the heat. There's this classical scholar named classical scholar named Erasmus, and he describes Paul's closing words here as pure flame, right? I love that. We get use some of that right now, right? These these words are are fire, spiritual um, fire that, that Paul is going to spit here um, uh, in these last um, couple of verses. So turn to Galatians six. It's going to be verses eleven through eighteen. Is what we're going to finish up. Page 975. Um, after we finish Galatians, that means next week is Judges. Um, so we're going to have a lot of fun uh, with that. Start praying for me if you've read Judges. Judges is tough, um, but it's good. It's worth mining. And we're going to get some really good gospel truths um, from that book. So start reading Judges um, throughout the week. And we'll, we'll begin that um, here next week. Um, but this week... I think I say about every other week that this or that passage is my favorite. Um, this is it right now. Uh, this one of these verses is just, it explains everything. It's brilliant. I, I hope it will hit, hit you as strongly as it has hit me. And if you haven't been here for a single other of uh, the 21 sermons on Galatians, you picked the perfect time to come because Paul summarizes everything and explains it all in these few short sentences. And, and in so succinctly explaining the heart of his letter, what he is doing is succinctly explaining the heart of the entire Christian faith, right? the very heart of the gospel. This is it. Uh, this is what it all comes down to. In a sense, this entire letter has been one long extended exercise in compare and contrast between these two fundamentally different approaches to life, two different philosophies, two entirely different belief systems. And as any good writer does, Paul concludes his letter by again holding those two up um, together um, for you to see. All right, so here we go. Two ways to live. There are no exceptions. You're either doing one or the other. And Paul's going to frame this closing, closing argument here around one word. And that word is boast. Right? Everyone is either boasting in the flesh or boasting in the cross. Right? One leads to death. One leads to life. That sound a little bit weird, right? Does that make much sense? Um, if it doesn't, good. Um, let, let's read the text, and then I'll explain to you what Paul is talking about. All right, so let me read it. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. You can just follow along in your copy of the Scriptures. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Now let me pray for our time um, as we begin. Father, there's a lot going on today. Um, I confess to being um, very distracted, uh, Lord. Uh, I pray right now for these next 30 or 40 minutes that you would just focus us, uh, focus my mind, focus the mind and heart of everyone in here, Father, on your word. Uh, and I'm a person who has revealed to us um, through your word. Father, I am very, very weak, uh, but you are very, very strong. Um, Father, my words are very insufficient, but your words are more than sufficient. Um, Father, 
So I pray that I would um, decrease so that you um, can increase. Father, work in this time. Speak um, through me. Um, Father, show us Jesus Christ. Show us what it means um, to boast in his cross. I pray all of this in his name. Amen. All right, so have you ever received um, a text or an email from somebody and it was written in all caps, right? It's terrifying, isn't it? Right? It's really like, it feels like they're yelling at you, doesn't it? Right? What, what, what's wrong? Why, why are you yelling at me? Right? And you're waiting for like this reply email, like, oh, sorry, I had all caps on it or something. Because if they don't, right, what does that mean? Well, we use all caps for emphasis. We use all caps to kind of shout and yell and say, no, this, this really matters. This is really, really important. I really mean this. <laughs> Well, well, Paul ends the last few lines of this letter in all caps. Right? We're pretty sure that most of the time, Paul often used what is called an amanuensis. Sounds fancy. It's not. It just means secretary. Right? Paul actually didn't physically write most of his letters. He would dictate his letters out loud to, to a scribe of this amanuensis, and they would write it for him. Right? Back when I worked at North Shore, Pastor Ed, he doesn't know how to use a computer or email or any of those things. He doesn't understand them. So he would speak to his secretary whose office was right beside him. He would randomly throughout the day just yell things out. She would write it down word for word, attach his name to it, and send out the email from Pastor Ed. If you ever get an email from him, it's not from him. Um, it's from his um, secretary. Well, that's exactly what Paul would do. He would choose an amanuensis. But scholars think that with verse 11... Paul stops dictating, and he starts writing. You see, he says, see with what large letters, and the Greek construction seems to say, see with what large letters I am now writing to you with my own hand. So scholars think that that refers to just these last eight verses, right? Romans 16, 2 tells us that Tertius wrote that letter um, for Paul. So maybe it was Tertius, maybe it was Luke. We don't know who wrote this letter for Paul, but I, I imagine him kind of pushing the scribe Side, he takes up the pen, or it wasn't a pen, he takes up the pen and he starts writing in big letters by himself, which is he is saying here, emphasis, pay attention. This is important. I am writing this part with my own words. I want you to make sure and get this. So, so what's so important? Well, as he's going to argue, life is so important. Eternity is on the line. There are these two diametrically opposed ways to live. And let's remind ourselves first of the context as we finish the letter. Let's make sure we know what it was about and what's going on. Right? Well, what's happening in this letter? Well, what was the occasion for the letter? What caused Paul to write it? All right, we're somewhere around the year 48 or 49 AD, right? So we're 15-ish years after the life of Christ. Paul was a missionary, right? He existed to spread the message of Jesus Christ and to start and establish these communities of Christians around the world. Well, years earlier, he had done so in the region of Galatia. And Galatia is basically central Turkey today, right in the middle of Turkey. That's Galatia. But, right, Paul's a missionary, right? I'm a pastor, right? My goal is to be here and stay here forever. You guys are stuck uh, with me, uh, Lord willing. Paul was a missionary. He would train up leaders. He'd establish a church and get it running. And then he would move on and do the same thing in a new area. Well, apparently, after he had started these churches and left them, right, some other missionaries came in after him. And these missionaries brought with them a message that was different than Paul's message. And it was this difference and the deadly danger of this difference that caused Paul to write this letter in hopes of saving the Galatians from being deceived. So if you want to understand this letter, if you want to understand the gospel, you've got to get this difference, right? A difference that Paul is going to claim and that is between life and death, heaven and hell, slavery and freedom. So what are these two messages and how are they different? Well, let's start with the new message that was being taught, what we're going to refer to as boasting in the flesh. We see it in verses 12 and 13. Right, this whole letter and the whole difference revolves around this one odd and awkward word. Uh, this word that is a little bit uncomfortable to be talking about in front of a bunch of people in public at church. Right? You see Paul use it five times in just these last few verses. Circumcision. What in the world? Right? Well, why are we talking about that in, in church? Um, Melissa and I seem to only be able to produce girls, um, so we don't have to worry about this. 
But if you've had a baby boy of any time recently, you probably run into the fact that there's like this huge debate out there over like the health um, pros or, or cons of circumcision uh, for your baby. I had a terrible memory, but for some reason, I have a very clear memory of AP Biology, my junior year in high school, um, in 2001, I had this very earthy and very odd uh, teacher. She was great, but she was weird. And her name was Mrs. Jeffries. And for some reason, she randomly went on this like impassioned tirade against the dangers of circumcision. Right? She sounded a lot like Paul. Right? She was talking about how like, oh, she didn't get her son circumcised. And she specifically said to her, you kids should not get your children circumcised when it comes time for that. I'm sitting there, we're sitting like 16 year old. Like, why are, we, why are we talking about this? This is really, really weird, right? But that's not at all what Paul is talking about here in these verses, right? Circumcision in the ancient world was not a matter of physical health, but it was a mark of spiritual identity, right? Here was the issue boiled down, Acts 15, 1 and 2. This is exactly what was happening in Galatia. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Right? So you see that. They were teaching no circumcision, no salvation. Or earlier in Galatians 2.16, um, we read Paul saying, by works of the law, no one will be justified. Meaning that these other new guys were teaching the opposite. That by works of the law, you can be justified. So here's what they were teaching. We're done with circumcision, right? Forget circumcision. Don't get caught up in the weirdness of that. Circumcision was not the issue. It was not the root of the issue. It was their particular manifestation of the root. So forget circumcision, but it's critical that you remember what circumcision represents. They say you have to do it for salvation. And Paul relates what they were teaching to the keeping of the law. In other words, they were teaching, quite simply, that to be saved, you had to do something. You had to contribute something to your own salvation. And now some of you are looking at me, and I can tell you're thinking, well, yeah, obviously. What's, what's the big deal? Of course you have to do something. Good, yes. All right, I'm glad you're thinking that. Because that's basically what the entire world is thinking. Right? This doesn't even register to us as significant because we're so used to hearing it. Because this is what every other religion teaches, including many that would claim to be Christian. This is what basically everyone understands religion to be about. Thus, they just naturally assume that this is what is true about Christianity as well. Oh, this is what the gospel is about as well. Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. But we'll get back to that in a second. Well, let's briefly look at these two verses and see what characterizes this message, which is a message that characterizes religion in general. First, notice in these verses that religion is external. Right? Paul says that these guys want to make a good showing in the flesh. Right? Circumcision is something that is done to the body. It is physical. It is external. Religion is something that you can see and quantify. And it is this overemphasis, this almost obsession with the external that characterizes religion today. Listen, you're all familiar with this. Religion is big and showy. There are lots of ceremonies and rituals. There's, there's pomp and circumstance. You've got to dress a certain way and do certain things and all, all of this. Right, there's always a long list of things that you have to do. The five pillars of Islam, you got to do those things. No eightfold path of Buddhism, you got to do those things. The seven sacraments, and on and on and on. But they're all basically saying the same thing. Do. Right? Which brings us to the second thing that characterizes religion. It's about you. And you have to do that something. So these guys are saying, you must be circumcised. You must keep the law. Do, 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 do. And if you do enough, and if you do a good enough job, then you can be saved as a result. Which finally brings us to that uh, important word, boasting. You see it in verse 13. They desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. If you're reading the King James, it says that they may glory in your flesh. Now, what does that mean? Think about it, right? Emma, uh, my daughter, likes to boast in the fact that she is faster than me, right? That may or may not be true. Um, she's pretty quick and I'm pretty out of shape. Um, but when it's a race around the table, right, there's not enough room for me to get up speed because you're turning every single step and her tiny little legs can turn fast and she 
pretty much is fashion, right? I can't keep up with her. Um, it's really sad. Um, but she's, she's proud of her speed, thus she boasts in it, right? It is something that she values, something that she is happy to be identified with. So she makes sure and lets me know that she is faster than me. But listen, she's, she's three, right? She doesn't quite have the social awareness to know that, oh, you don't boast out loud to people. That's, that's kind of rude, right? We all know that it's rude and it's obnoxious um, to outwardly boast to one another, so we tend not to do it, right? We don't struggle with this. I, I don't struggle at all walking around and telling you how, how great I am or anything. But that's not what Paul is talking about here, right? Don't think boast as an outwardly bragging to those around you. Again, think internally. Think more of what you boast to yourself about. And if that's the case, then what you boast in is what you most value and treasure about yourself. Right? The thing about yourself that you are most proud of. The thing that is most important to you and most identifies you as you. Right? This word means to boast in, to glory in, to trust in, to rejoice in, to revel in, to, to live for. Right, the object of our boasting fills our vision, our, our horizon. It, it, it engrosses our attention. It absorbs our time and energy. In a word, our boast is our obsession. Right, what you boast in is what you live for, what you worship, what gives your life value and meaning. And religion teaches you to boast about something in you. And that's what these guys were doing. Right? They were trying to get people circumcised so that they could boast about how many they got. Meaning, they were trying to justify themselves. Right? They were trying to prove themselves. They were identifying themselves and trying to give their lives meaning and value based upon their performance. Right? You see churches do this a lot today with, with baptisms. Right? We had 500 baptisms so, this year. I had four baptisms last week. Right? Listen, I probably feel pretty good if we did or baptisms last week, except Andy broke the baptism, so we can't use it. We'll get it fixed, and we'll do some more um, soon, right? But we tend to use numbers, right? And oh, I got all the baptisms, oh, we had 100 people show up, and we, you know, we start to feel pretty good about ourselves. You have uh, an icy day when nobody shows up, you're like, oh man, nobody's coming, right? Because we justify ourselves based upon our performance. That's what they were doing. They're trying to get converts to their cause so that they can feel better about themselves because theirs was an external religion, a religion of works. And the more and the better they did, the better they felt about themselves. And listen, this is just absolutely wired into us, isn't it? We're left to ourselves, this is how we all naturally operate, Christian and non-Christian. Most Christians end up relating to God as if their relationship to Him was based upon their performance. Right? So when you're attending church and, and you're reading your Bible and you're praying, you feel a lot better about your relationship to God. Right? You feel more secure in your relationship with Him and closer to Him. But when you're struggling with those things, what happens? Right? You start to feel separated from God to the point where sometimes you even start to, to doubt. I don't even know God. What am I? What? You know, do I even know this guy? Am I actually really um, saved? Well, why does that happen? Well, it's because of our tendency to base everything on our performance, on, on us and what we do. But guys, listen, non-Christians are no different. They're doing the same thing, just not consciously directed toward God. Right? Have you ever wondered why you get so anxious about what your parents think of you? Or about your boss? Or about your professor? Have you ever wondered why your failure in a job or a work project or a relationship has been so devastating? Well, it's because you're doing the same thing that these Judaizers were doing. You have invested your identity in your performance. Whether it's in school or work or your family or some relationship or how much money you can make. Whatever it is, you may or may not believe in God. But we're all basically doing the same thing. Or we're allowing these other things to serve as our functional gods. They become our identity. And when something then challenges that identity, and when, when you realize that you're not as great as you thought, or you don't have it as together as you thought, oh, it's devastating down to your core. So this whole, the whole world operates according to this performance ritual. Do good, feel good. Do good, be safe. Do good, be accepted and valued in the eyes of others and yourself. That is boasting in the flesh. It is identifying yourself by something about you and investing everything in that something. Relying on it. Depending on it. 
Right, one more quick thing before we move on. Look back up at verse 12. Paul says that they were trying to force the Galatians to be circumcised so that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Why in the world would getting people circumcised spare them from persecution? Well, back in 511, Paul has talked about the offense of the cross. We don't talk about that much anymore. You see, these guys were going around preaching that you had to contribute something to your own salvation, in part because the world loves that message. And we are used to that message. We love being told that if we can just get our acts together a little bit, we can just kind of clean things up a little bit, if we can just choose correctly and be a good enough person, do enough rituals, then we can be saved. Right? We like having the power. We like having the control. We like being told, oh yeah, you can do it. But the cross, the cross is an entirely different message. And the cross, if you really understand it, is an extremely insulting and offensive message. And if you've never recognized and wrestled with what Paul calls the offense of the cross, then you may not have yet understood it. So, so let's go ahead and, and turn there. All right, the world says boast in the flesh. It's religion. It's external. It's about you and what you do. That's the message Paul is writing um, to counter because that message, he says, is directly opposed to his message. That message is directly opposed to the gospel. Verse 14. Far be it from me to boast in anything, to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, all right, you guys go ahead. You keep boasting in the flesh. You keep boasting in your performance. I'm going to boast exclusively in something outside of my flesh, something that has nothing to do with my performance. And again, don't forget what boasting is, not outwardly bragging. Boasting is what identifies you, what you most value, what most defines you, and gives your life meaning. The world says, find that thing in yourself. Paul says, absolutely not. I will only boast. I will only find meaning and be identified by the cross. Which, guys, come on. Think outside of your Christian bubble for a second. Because that sounds really weird. Right? We're so familiar and used to hearing this that we forget what the cross was. It was a torture instrument. It was a device of death. In Latin, the word for cross was crux. C-U-R-X. The crux of the matter. Cross. And that word at about this time in Latin society was um, unmentionable. Right? It was like saying the name Baltimore. Right? You, didn't, you did not do it. I mean, instead of saying it, right, they would refer to it as the unlucky tree. Right? And they wouldn't use the word cross. They'd call it something else. So what Paul is saying here would be like boasting today in the electric chair or, or the guillotine or the lethal ejection or, or the hangman's noose. Why in the world is he boasting? Why is he identifying, investing, finding his value and meaning in this instrument of death, this cross? Well, it's because of the person and the purpose of that cross. He qualifies it there as the cross of his Lord Jesus Christ. And it's amazing how much is contained in those three words. Right? The cross is significant. Paul can boast in it because of who Jesus was and what he came to do. Which was what? Well, those two words sandwiching his name actually tell us. First, he was Lord. And I don't have time to get into this and walk you through this in detail. But Lord means God. Right? Well, when Thomas meets the risen Jesus in John 20, 28, he cries out, My Lord and my God. Right? The word Lord in the Greek is, is Kyrios, and it carries with it the idea of power and authority. So your Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, were written in Hebrew, right? As Greek becomes more and more um, dominant, Hebrew scholars then took that Old Testament and translated it into Greek. And what they did is they took this word Kyrios, this word Lord, and they translated God's personal name Yahweh with that word. So when you're reading the Old Testament, whenever you see Lord in all caps, it's, it's Yahweh. But in the Greek, Septuagint, it is Kyrios. So in the Old Testament, God the Father is Lord. Then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in the New Testament, and he very boldly claims that title for himself. In the New Testament, Jesus is Kyrios. He is Lord. He is God. 
Okay, that's, that's pretty big. But he's not just God. He is also Christ. Which again, is not Jesus' last name. It is a title. It is the Greek for the Hebrew Messiah. Which just means the anointed one. And again, no time to do this justice. But as you start to read through the Old Testament, you, you will constantly run into all these promises of this, this one individual. This one guy that was going to come and was going to do something. He was going to come and deliver his people. He would be a rescuer. And this is exactly how Paul described Jesus back in the very beginning of the letter in Galatians 1, 4. He says, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us. So here's where the Messiah, Jesus, came to do. And here's where the cross comes in. He came to rescue us, and He um, does so by giving Himself for our sins. And that's basically the gospel right there. But let's, let's unpack it. The Messiah, as a deliverer, obviously implies that there is something that we need to be delivered from. Which, according to the Bible, is sin and evil. And for the second one, I don't have to try very hard to convince you that it exists, and that something isn't right with the world, right? ISIS just beheaded 21 um, Christians, and it thought it'd be fun to post it on Facebook and Twitter, right? That's, right? I, don't have to, I can stop there, right? I don't have to make my argument. Evil exists in the world. Something is wrong. The problem is, it's easy to recognize all the wrong and the evil out there, but we're often um, completely blind to the fact that it is in here as well. And there's this great and famous Russian author named Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and his most famous quote that he ever wrote says, If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere out there committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate from them and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Right, so the Bible says that we have a heart problem. Now, the Bible uh, explains it in a number of different ways, but for our purposes, it makes the most sense to talk about it in terms of what we just looked at. Jesus came, has come to rescue us because of our boasting in the flesh. Because that's really what sin is. Now sure, according to Emma, sin is doing bad things. And it is, right? It is breaking the law. And wrongs must be made right. There must be justice. But that's not the only way that the Bible explains our problem. And I think that this idea of boasting in the flesh in 21st century America is a helpful way to understand why sin is such a big deal and why God even cares. Why, why, why does he just get over it? Right? Why does it matter? Well, Romans 1.21 says that our problem results from the fact that although we knew God, we did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. Meaning... In spite of creating us, in spite of giving us life and everything else, we turned our backs on him and rejected him. But again, really, what, like, what's the big deal? Um, I've used this illustration before, but, but think of it as you have a mother. Um, her husband has just passed away um, while she's still pregnant um, with her son. Um, she is now single and alone. She gives birth to this son, and it's just the two of them. She literally brings him into the world. She gives him life, he owes his life to her, then she spends the next 18 years by herself, killing herself, working three jobs, going without, so that she can save every penny for her son. She puts him in good schools, um, she pays for the best tutors, she gives everything for him. She pours herself out for his good. As a result, he gets into the best schools, he gets into Harvard, uh, one of the best um, schools in the world, he gets a great job. His entire future is secure because of her. What does this son owe his mother? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Everything that he has, including his very life, was given to him by her. He would have nothing without her. And that should affect his relationship with her. He should love her, spend time with her, care for her. She sacrificed everything so that he could have everything. But imagine that if instead his response to all of this was to reject his mother, to completely cut himself off from her, to not talk to her or communicate with her in any way, to give her no thanks or credit, and to then spend the rest of his life boasting about how great he was and about all of the amazing things that he had accomplished. What would you do? 
I hope you slapped the guy, right? right? What, what, a, what a jerk, right? How can he reject and ignore the one who gave everything for him? Who, who gave him life, who sacrificed her own life for his? It, it would be the highest of offenses. It should make you angry and disturbed, right? Who would do such a thing? Well, that's exactly how Paul is explaining sin in Romans chapter 1. Right? That's why boasting in the flesh, that's why our sin is such an affront to God. He created us, He gave us everything, so we then rightfully owe Him everything. Thus to reject Him is wrong. It is, it's not just a bad thing. It is cosmic treason. It is looking to the giver of your life and the giver of everything and saying, no, I don't want anything to do with you. And he is rightly offended by that. And he is right to pursue justice for that offense. That is our problem. It's not just that we broke some arbitrary rules. Right? It's just rules, right? Yes, yeah, sin is breaking rules. It's bad. But it's, it's so much worse when you think of it in terms of relationships. What you have done. You have rejected and rebelled against the very one who gave you life. And justice demands that there be payment for sin, right? A murderer kills someone, we expect that person to pay for their crime. It's no different with our crimes, our sins. And Romans 6.23 tells us that that payment is death. Right? We rejected the author and the giver of life, thus the natural consequence is death. That's what we all earn and deserve, and that's why Jesus came to rescue us by giving himself for our sins on the cross. Meaning, we sin, right? We deserve to die, but he died for us. And we rightfully deserve death, and he dies in our place. He makes the payment we were going to have to make. He pays and cancels our debt, and he does so on the cross. So, so are you starting to understand now why the cross is the only thing worth boasting about? Right? It is so because it means that God himself, the one who created everything, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, that God loved us enough to come down here and die for us. He's, he's just because he's God. He has to be just. So there must be a payment for sin, but instead of demanding that payment from us, he provides the payment himself for us through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And that's why Paul is so adamant that what these Judaizers are teaching and what religion and the rest of the world is teaching is nothing like the gospel. And we saw that religion was external. We'll look at verse 15. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision. Translation, nothing that we can do counts for anything because that's just external. It's not about the external. So what does count? He says, a new creation, which is internal. If we have a heart problem, then the external cannot help that. But, what, but when God saves us, He makes us new. He does the work giving us a new heart. And it is from that new heart internally that the gospel works. And that's why, listen, we're not only concerned here with rituals and ceremonies and magic prayers and walking aisles. None of that does anything. None of that can touch the heart. That is all external. But God can touch the heart. Grace does touch the heart. Which brings us to the second um, difference. Religion is external and human. The gospel is internal and also divine. It doesn't originate with us. Meaning we don't do it. Jonah 2.9 salvation belongs to not you, not me, to the Lord. Right? Religion tells you all these things that you need to do to be saved. But that's not the gospel. Right? The gospel has nothing to do with do. John Stott. Um, great pastor writing about this verse. Uh, I love what he says here because it's bold and it sounds wrong to us and we're offended by it. He says, he writes, What then must we do to be saved? In a sense, nothing. Because Jesus Christ has done it all. See, religion says something, 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 do this, whatever it is. The gospel says nothing, whatever, whatever. It's completely done for you. God has done it. All of it. There's no magic formula. There's no trick. There's no secret words. It's not about doing good or any ritual. It's all about Christ. It's all about who He is and what He has done for you on that cross. That's why Paul will only boast 
in the cross. Because he knows that it's all he's got. He knows that it is his only hope. He knows that the cross is the only way of salvation. And he's just practically begging the Galatians here. He's begging us here to listen to him. There is no alternative. There is no middle ground or other way. It is either the flesh, yourself, or the cross of Christ. You are boasting in one or the other. Meaning one of them defines you and motivates you, identifies you, and sustains you. Which one is it? And verse 16 tells you which it should be. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Right? Again, don't think rule like, like a law, but rule as a, a principle. Right? The principle that we just talked about. Um, boasting in the cross. The principle that is explained in this entire letter from beginning to end. Right? Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Right, that's, that's basically Galatians right um, there. Which means, though it has almost become cliche these days, that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Which then means that Jesus plus anything else equals nothing. Right? And what the Judaizers were doing is saying, yeah, Jesus, 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 but also this. You've also got to do this. And Paul says that is not anything this is that's not the gospel at all. So you add anything, anything that you have to do, right? Any works or anything that is about you, it becomes not the gospel at all, right? The gospel is all what he has done for you, which is everything. And the result, look at the result that he gives here, peace and mercy. I feel like let those two words are the resolution of the whole book, right? Paul has just been just building and building. You can tell he, he's angry and agitated and he's writing very aggressively and then it's here as he kind of sits down takes a deep breath, sits back and finds great comfort in the result of what Jesus has done for him. Peace and mercy. Again, it's a, peace is really good. But not peace between each other. Not, oh, world peace. That's really good. You want that. No, he means peace with God. You were God's enemy. Now you are his friend. And mercy. You deserve judgment and wrath and hell, now you get forgiveness and joy and heaven, even though you didn't deserve any of it. Right? That's, that's mercy. Right? That's, that's grace. So if it's flesh or the cross, you're doing one or the other. Do, do you see the difference? Do you understand really the cross? Have you wrestled with its offensiveness? Right? Listen, the cross is, is offensive and it is hated um, because it is directly opposed to all schemes of self-salvation. Every other scheme is a scheme of self-salvation. Every other scheme says, be a good person, try hard enough, and if you do a good enough job, then you can be saved, or you can have value, or meaning, or your life will matter, however you want um, to put it. But the cross is the only one that, that says the very difficult message that you're not good enough, by the way, and you can't be good enough, and you can't do anything yourself to rectify your problem. So we hate hearing that. I, I don't like hearing that. I don't like being told that I'm a sinner and I'm not good enough and I can't fix my own problem. So the cross is hugely offensive because it, it offends our pride and our attacks our autonomy and our independence and our ability. But at the same time, right, the cross also says that the creator God of the universe loved you so much that he entered into this evil world. He submitted himself to your mess. And he died for you to give you the forgiveness, the acceptance, the approval, the identity, the family, the inheritance, the love, and the life that you so desperately wanted. And how? How do you, how do you get it? You boast in him. Which means all you do is you rest in him. You trust in him. You, you identify yourself with him. He is your everything. Right? That's what faith is. It is um, repenting, giving up your own attempts at self-salvation, faith, resting and trusting and turning to him. He has done all of it. Right? That's the gospel message. That's what grace is. Everything else is telling you um, grace plus something, or you do this, or follow this rule. And here's this amazingly unique message that says you couldn't do it, but God has done it for you. You were a sinner, you were his enemy, and 
he has come and run after you, and he has pursued you, and he has loved you, and he has done everything um, to give you everything, right? That's, that's worth it, right? He, he offers everything for nothing, right? It's all him. And that's why the only thing worth boasting in, the only thing worth resting in, trusting in, and depending on is that cross. Right, so let's turn to him um, as we close um, and call out to him in a word of prayer. Father, I confess uh, my tendency um, to boast and many other things. Father, I confess um, how quick I am to try um, to infuse meaning and value and identity into my life through my, my work, uh, through my preaching, through my accomplishments, my intellect, by my family, whatever it is. Um, Lord, uh, I'm very prone to wonder, Father. I'm very um, prone to seek these other things I and mean, cling to them and rest in them and depend on them. Father, forgive us for how quick we are to boast in the flesh. Father, show us what it means um, to boast in the cross. Father, show us why. Why would we, why would we even want um, to do that? Uh, what the cross is and what it means. Uh, it means that we were helpless, but it means uh, that you were so good and merciful and kind. To us, to come yourself in the person of Jesus Christ and to die um, so that we could live. Um, God. We don't understand and uh, we forget very, very quickly. Um, uh, so, Father, I pray right now that you would do um, in my heart and in the heart of everyone in here what I cannot do, uh, what my words cannot accomplish. Father, your word can, uh, your spirit can. So, Father, convict us of sin, show us where we tend to boast. Um, and the cross, Father, give us a great desire, touch, and stir our hearts and our affections um, so that we want um, to know Christ, so that we want um, to follow Christ and to serve Him um, with everything that we have. Father, we have nothing um, apart from you. Father, every good thing um, comes from you. Father, help us um, to believe that. Help us to live in light of that. And Father, we do believe and um, help our unbelief. Father, we do boast um, in the cross of Christ. Help us and forgive us for when we are quick. And brother to boast in our own flesh. And Father, we ask that you would do this for us at this time. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.